On Saturday, December 10, 1988, the body of a young woman was found on Bayside Drive in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. It was on the bike path, and the people who cleaned it were the first to find it. They didn't waste much time and called the police right away. When the police arrived, they started looking around the whole area. When they talked to some people in the area, the police discovered that there was a cleanup event on Saturday along Bayside Drive. After the investigation was over, the police found a skeleton and some pieces of clothes and shoes, but they didn't know who the bones belonged to. Donna Fontana, a forensic anthropologist for the state of New Jersey, then looked at the remains and concluded that they belonged to a young white female between the ages of 15 and 18, who had probably been dead since the mid-1970s. Members of the MCPO and the Atlantic Highlands Police Department first looked into the case together. They used different methods of investigation, but none of them were able to find out the identity of the deceased. In the 1990s, a DNA profile was made from the bones and used to make comparisons, which also didn't work at first. In their investigation of this case, the police always came up with nothing, but they didn't give up looking. They were always talking to people in Atlantic Highlands, but they still couldn't get a break in this case. Eventually, the case turned cold, with no new leads. Then, in 2020, Lieutenant Andrea Tozzi and Detective Wayne Rayner of the MCPO contacted Bode Technology, a Virginia-based DNA analysis company, to look into the case using much more advanced technology than had been available before. The person who had been known only as Jane Doe for a long time was finally found to have a distant relative who lived in Georgia and was a woman. The relative agreed to an interview and then agreed to put DNA from her mother into the Bode's database, which led to the discovery of another lead. A Pennsylvanian woman was thought to be Jane Doe's youngest sister. The woman was talked to in August and agreed to give a DNA sample. The test results meant that there was a 99.9997% chance that Jane Doe was related to the person immediately. The Middlesex Regional Medical Examiner Office's Deputy Medical Examiner Dr. Lauren Tama then looked at the new information and made it official that the remains were those of Nancy Fitzgerald. The investigation had been looking for this for decades. After that, Nancy Fitzgerald's relatives who were still alive were told, and her body was sent to them to be buried. Finally, the detectives could get in touch with them and talk to them. They learned more about Nancy Fitzgerald after that. Nancy Carol Fitzgerald was born in New Jersey and grew up in Essex County. Her mother and father had her in 1956. In 1968, her father died. Kathleen was the name of her sister. She moved from Crown Street to Moore Avenue in Bloomfield, New Jersey, with her mother and siblings. She went to Berkeley Elementary School and North Junior High School in Bloomfield. She was kicked out of school because of drug use at a young age. A person used to sell drugs to her and other girls in exchange for prostitution. In 1971, she overdosed and was rushed to a hospital by police. After being treated, when she was taken home, police found barbiturates in her bedroom that she was supposed to sell. On the 2nd of April, 1972, Nancy had Easter dinner with her family at their home in Bloomfield. This was the last time they had seen Nancy, because the next day, on the 3rd of April, she went missing. She was 16 years old at the time. On the night of the 3rd of April, her mother and sister called the police. The police began to look into it. When Nancy went missing, she was wearing knee-high socks, a lace-covered bra, and platform sandals with ankle straps made of leather. She regularly went to the dentist because she had a gap in her upper central in scissors. After she had been gone for a year, her mother got a phone call from a strange girl. The girl had begged and screamed for help, saying, Mom, I made a big mistake. Come get me. Come get me help. Nancy's mother had thought she was Kathleen, as they had lost hope of finding Nancy by this time. But when Kathleen came home that night safely, her mother realized who it could have been. They contacted the police again, but just as in the past, 
the police couldn't find anything. Nancy's sister Kathleen traveled the country to search for Nancy over the years, but she also failed to find her sister. Finally, decades later, they got to know what happened to her in 2020 with the results of DNA testing. Raymond Santiago, the prosecutor from Monmouth County, said in a statement, Today's announcement results from decades of hard work by a network of people whose collective determination and creativity proved to be unstoppable. It's also a sign of our firm commitment to find the truth and serve the interests of justice. No matter how much time has passed or what obstacles might ever get in the way of an investigation. Fifty years later, thanks to modern DNA testings and interviews with far-off relatives in Georgia and Pennsylvania, Authorities have confirmed that Fitzgerald's remains were located after all these years. The consistent development in forensic science and DNA testing is solving many unsolved cases around the world. We should be thankful to all the people behind this development. A man found mutilated in a field. For years, there were no answers, and this past week, police made an arrest in the case. On November 19, 1997, a farmer in Blissfield Town, Michigan made a gruesome discovery while preparing to harvest the remaining corn in his field. As he walked through his field, on the ground he saw what remained of a human body. The corpse had no head or hands. The body was naked, and a search of the field yielded no evidence that could be linked to the mutilated corpse. The discovery would remain a mystery for a quarter of a century, but new technology has uncovered two suspects who may be able to solve the puzzle once and for all. Blissfield Township in Michigan is a mix of rural and suburban living. With a population of 3,905, it is a close-knit and conservative farming community with acres of surrounding cornfields. It is tucked away between bigger towns giving residents a sanctuary away from the fast-paced life of the 21st century. It is here the mystery of the John Doe in the cornfield begins. In the early hours of November 19, 1997, a Lenawee County farmer went down to inspect his cornfield as he made preparations to cut the stalks down for the harvest. There had been some light snow the previous evening, but not enough to damage any crops. As he made his way closer to the edge of the field, he noticed a bulge on the ground that was covered by a light dusting of snow. As he drew closer, he realized he was staring down at a dead body. However, the body was missing its head and both hands. Extremely shaken by what he had seen, he contacted the police who arrived at the farm with haste. When forensic teams arrived, they quickly determined the body had been dumped here a while ago and that it was male. It had already begun decomposing with insect and animal activity contributing to the further degradation of the body. The area was searched for evidence, but nothing was found. It was becoming clear to investigators that it was a homicide, and a violent one too. It was also clear the crime had occurred in a different place and the remains were dumped in the cornfield, as there were no traces of blood surrounding the body like there would have been if its limbs had been removed in the field. Also, the Section 22 roadway of Blissfield Township was just 50 yards away from the crime scene, giving people easy access to the space. The body was taken to the coroner's office for further examination. There were no distinguishing marks, such as scars, tattoos, or birthmarks, anywhere on the body. The medical examiner estimated that the murder occurred within the last three months due to the state of decomposition. Looking closely at the wounds made from the dismemberment, the examiner noted that the victim's body parts had been sawed off. There were saw striations around the neck bones and wrist bones. The examiner believed that it was clearly an attempt to hinder investigators in identifying the victim. The coroner was able to gather some basic information based on tissue samples and estimations. He determines the victim to be light-skinned, of Hispanic descent, and between the ages of 20 to 40. The estimated height of the victim was between 5 feet 8 inches and 5 feet 10 inches, 
with a weight of around 150 pounds. Investigators set out to find answers. Without a head or hands, there was no way to ascertain the identity of the victim. They searched missing persons' databases and questioned people from the area. A theory that did take hold was that the victim was a part of a drug deal gone wrong. A few locals alleged that a drug deal had recently occurred nearby in Toledo, Ohio. Investigators followed up on that lead, but it led nowhere. Another tip was received from an anonymous source early during the investigation in 1997. The caller told investigators that the body may have belonged to a man known only as Roberto. Roberto was described as a Hispanic male between the ages of 20 to 50 with dark hair and a mustache. According to the source, Roberto was from Texas. He was also married and a father. Roberto was allegedly on a trip to Chicago when he disappeared. They were also told that Roberto had a house somewhere between McAllen and Westlaco in Texas, where he raised chickens. Using this information, investigators entered these details into the National Missing and Unidentified Persons Systems known as NAMUS. A composite sketch was developed and circulated to local news outlets, but sadly, this lead ended up going nowhere in the end. The pressure of solving the case started to grow on investigators, but unable to locate the head and hands, they were left chasing shadows. Over the years, they looked into the case, trying to find new leads, but nothing seemed to ever actually go anywhere. Eventually, the body was given the placeholder name of Lenawee County John Doe, and buried in a pauper cemetery in 1997. Two years later, in September 1999, a DNA profile of the victim was developed, but it did not lead investigators anywhere at the time. It too was uploaded to the NamUs database, but there was still no positive identification. For a time, the investigation went cold again, as no one came forward with any new information. In 2016, the case became active once again. Police were investigating drug-related crimes in the area and believed there to be suspected links to the John Doe case. However, nothing panned out at the time. Then, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the John Doe case was put on the back burner for a while. But the development of a new cold case unit in 2022 brought the Lenawee County John Doe case back into the spotlight. The unit was made up of state police detectives, as well as criminal justice students and faculty members from Michigan State University. After much investigation and reconstruction of the crime, there finally was a breakthrough in the case. Decades, a man found mutilated in a field. For years, there were no answers, and this past week, police made an arrest in the case. 25 years after the murder in 2023, Michigan authorities announced that two Ohio men were arrested in connection with the 1997 John Doe case. An arrest warrant was issued on January 17, 2023, for brothers Ricardo Supulveda, aged 51 from Cincinnati, and Michael Supulveda, aged 49 from Toledo. The two men were arrested on the same day the arrest warrant was issued by U.S. Marshals, who had been assisting with the investigation. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel thanked the teams for their persistence in following up the leads on the case and making the arrests. Michigan State Police worked with multiple local and federal law enforcement agencies and prosecutors to gather evidence and establish a timeline of events. I am grateful for their persistence in pursuing this case. All crime victims deserve justice, regardless of how long it takes to receive it, said Nessel in a news release. No information has yet been released on how investigators narrowed down the search to both Supulveda brothers, but it is alleged a possible drug debt incident may have been the contributing factor. Both Ricardo Supulveda and his brother Michael have been on police radars since early on in the investigation, said Sergeant Larry Rothman, who headed the cold case unit. These guys have been on our radar, so to speak, since early on, based on the dealings that they've had in the Toledo area with narcotics and drugs. That's how they are probably connected to our victim, through the drug trade. 
said Rothman. One of the leads, said Rothman, had come from a woman in the Upper Peninsula who recalled a slaying that had followed a similar pattern. Both men were extradited to Lenawee County, with Michael waiving his right to extradition, while Ricardo underwent a hearing with the Michigan Attorney General. If convicted, they will face several charges that carry life sentences, including first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. The other charges include assault with intent to maim, tampering with evidence, and conspiracy to commit tampering with evidence, which all carry a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison each. Although the two suspects are in custody, the investigation remains ongoing. Rothman said it was still early in the investigation, but the arrest could be the key to the case. It's still early in the investigation, so there's not a whole lot I can say. But we feel these two guys knew the victim. They were acquaintances at one point. The John Doe still remains unidentified, but investigators are working with crime labs and genealogy databases to find answers. The DNA profile from 1999 has been uploaded to several genealogy websites, with investigators hoping for a positive result. Rothman called genetic genealogy testing a breakthrough in solving crimes. The potential to be able to solve decades-old cases that we didn't have before with genealogy and technology is kind of a breakthrough thing, he said. Sergeant Rothman said there were still a few things out there they were trying to piece together, and there is the possibility that more people could be charged in connection with the murder. We're hoping other people come forward. There's no doubt that other people from the time period know some things, he said. Someone's potentially missing a dad. Someone's potentially missing a husband. There's somebody out there, and we believe this person might be from Texas, and someone's missing their loved one, and they have no clue where they went. They just know they left in 1997 and never returned, said Rothman. With the advancements in technology and the use of genetic genealogy in solving cases that would have otherwise been forgotten, answers to long-lost mysteries are now being found. In highlighting these cases, we hope that we can aid investigations by bringing awareness to a wider audience. Information regarding who to contact in this case will be left in the description box. If you or anyone you know has been missing a loved one, please use the platforms available to contact your local authorities with any information that can help solve a case. What did you think of today's case? Do you feel that with all the new methods of investigation, we can solve the oldest cold cases out there? Leave your responses in the comments section below. An arrest in a murder mystery, a case that went cold more than 40 years ago in Solano County. Tonight, the sheriff's office arrested 76-year-old Herman Hobbs. When the bullet-riddled body of a woman was discovered in a cornfield in Dixon, California on August 3, 1980, authorities were left scratching their heads trying to figure out who the victim could be and what had led her to such a brutal end. With not even her identity known, the case seemed to be nearly impossible. But was this a premeditated murder? Or was the victim in the wrong place? at the wrong time. Twenty miles from Sacramento, Dixon was incorporated into Solano County in 1878. Those that call it home get to enjoy a suburban lifestyle without the rush of big city living. It is a farming community known for its alfalfa fields, dairy farms, and sheep farms. Dixon also plays host to the annual Lamb Town Festival and the Mayfair, the oldest state fair in California. In 1980, Dixon became the focus of a crime that shocked the small farming community when the body of a young woman was found in a cornfield. On August 3, 1980, at around 3 p.m., in the height of summer in the United States, two cornfield workers were busy clearing a field near Seavers Road in Dixon. As they made their way through the stalks of corn, on the ground they noticed something unusual. Approaching with abject caution, the men cleared a path and discovered the body of a young woman. Without hesitation, they called their manager, who contacted the police immediately. 
Within moments, officers from the Solano County Sheriff's Office arrived and cordoned off the scene. It was ruled a homicide as the victim appeared to have been shot multiple times. They searched the immediate area for clues but found nothing. There was nothing belonging to the victim in the area, nor any form of identity. After questioning other workers and potential witnesses, they received no answers to their growing questions. Investigators surmised that the young woman was killed elsewhere and dumped in the cornfield as it was close to the road. The victim's body was taken to the county mortuary for a full autopsy. The cause of death was ruled as homicide by gunshot wounds. She had been shot six times in the head and neck. There were no signs of a sexual assault or defensive wounds. Using the victim's fingerprints, investigators tried to search various databases to find any record that would help identify her. A search of missing person databases didn't provide any leads, nor did the victim have any criminal records. She was named as the Dixon Jane Doe, and a profile was developed with pictures and a composite. In the report, she was described as being white with brown eyes and dark brown hair cut into a punk rock style. She also had a small dark mole on the left side of her chin. The coroner estimated her age to be between 15 and 23. Her height was measured at 5 feet and 2 inches and her weight at 155 pounds. At the time of her death, she was wearing a green wool sweater and a light blue long-sleeved smock with wooden buttons, a small floral design, and a safety pin that was used to secure the top together. On her left finger was a white metal spoon ring, and she was also wearing a wooden bead necklace. Despite the information being made available to all local police departments and sheriff's offices, the victim's case grew cold quickly. The leads dried up and tips were few and far between. Investigators kept checking back with the victim's fingerprints, but nothing was found on any systems. The victim's remains were buried in a Solano County cemetery a month after the body was discovered and marked as a Dixon Jane Doe. The case grew cold. Periodically, investigators would look through the file. It was ten years later they received a new lead, on June 19, 1992, the Solano County Sheriff's Office received new information regarding the Dixon Jane Doe case. The National Missing Persons Unit contacted the investigation team regarding a missing persons report made by Augustine and Sally Campilia on May 12, 1992. They reported that their daughter, 21-year-old Holly Ann Campilia, went missing in July 1980. According to the Campilia family, they had reported Holly Ann missing in July 1980 after receiving a letter from her that stated she did not want to have any more contact with them. They tried to trace the address on the letter but discovered that it was from a fake street address. Holly Ann's parents then discovered that the missing persons report that they filed initially in July 1980 was somehow deleted from the national database two weeks after it was made. Having received the new information, investigators ran the details received through the database. They also requested DNA samples to test against that of their Jane Doe. Five weeks later, the Campilia family received the devastating news that Holly Ann was, in fact, the Dixon Jane Doe. Holly Ann Campilia was born in 1959 to parents Augustine and Sally Campilia. She was the eldest of five daughters and raised in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. She was a free spirit, according to her family, and always cheerful. She adored her sisters and often sewed their dresses and helped with styling their hair. Her father, Augustine, said she was a talented and artistic person. Life had seemed to be on track for Holly Ann, as she was performing well in school, scoring straight A's. However, it was in her senior year in 1976 that Holly Ann began to change. Her parents noticed her withdrawing from the family and then discovered she had started abusing substances. They also noticed the change in her mental health and her emotional breakdowns. What they couldn't understand was the root cause of her problems. Despite her personal problems, Holly Ann went on to enroll at the Glassboro State College studying toward a degree in fine arts. 
It was then that she started to behave erratically again. Holly Ann began running away from home. The first incident occurred in 1977. She disappeared for over a month before her parents found her walking along Route 70 about a mile from their home. Over the next few years, Holly Ann continued her pattern of running away from home and becoming less responsive to the medical treatment she was receiving for her emotional problems. Her mother Sally said that Holly Ann needed to be watched at all times or she absconded from home constantly. Holly Ann's family tried desperately to make sure they gave her all the help possible. The last time she saw her daughter alive was June 10th, 1980 while they were on their way to a counseling center. Holly Ann began to grow agitated, and while her mother drove, she started to have an outburst, insisting she needed to do things her way and see the world. Holly Ann tried opening the door as her mother drove. Sally pulled the car over to the side of the road to reason with Holly Ann, who immediately walked away. Despite trying to pull her back, Sally could not hold on to her daughter. Sally immediately returned home and called the Cherry Hill Police to report Holly Ann missing. They provided assistance by stopping several girls who looked like Holly Ann, but it was too late. She had already made her way out of town. A month later, they received a letter from Holly Ann addressed from Sacramento. According to the letter, Holly Ann said she was living with two guys and told her parents not to think of her anymore. A trace of the address led them nowhere. It was then they reported her missing and had her name and profile uploaded to the missing persons database. Little did they know, her details were accidentally erased from the system. The Campilia family turned to other missing persons networks and social security to see if Holly Ann had somehow turned up somewhere on their radars. For years, her family waited for answers. I just kept hoping she would show up one day with grandchildren, but... With each year, I'd lose a little hope, said Sally. After 12 years of holding out hope, the Campilia family had finally found Holly Ann and in a way received the closure they needed. My daughter said to me, Mom, Holly gave us 12 years to get used to this, said Sally. With each year, we lost a little hope. In a way, knowing what happened to her is some kind of relief, she said. Holly Ann's remains were flown back to New Jersey from California for her final burial in 1992. Sally remarked that it would be the first and last time Holly Ann would be on a plane. She could never wait for a plane. She either hitchhiked or took a bus. When they send her body home, it will be the first time she was ever on a plane. And the last. Investigators now had a name for the victim and worked with Holly Ann's family to find answers to her murder. Having not heard from her in over 12 years, they could offer no new information that would help the case. They were back to square one. No new leads meant no moving forward with the investigation. The case went cold again. As the case sat cold, the family began looking at the new technology that was being introduced to solve cold cases. In 2021, Holly Ann's sisters approached the Solano County Sheriff's Office to find out if it was possible to retest all the biological evidence that was collected from the crime scene and Holly Ann's body. The Sheriff's Office reviewed the case and resubmitted the evidence. Fortunately, the evidence was preserved properly. Advancements in technology allowed for the biological material to be tested despite how old the samples were. The DNA samples were sent to the Serological Research Institute, who were able to discover a foreign DNA profile. The lab results confirmed that the foreign DNA found on several pieces of evidence was that of a male. With a new DNA profile, officials submitted their new findings to the San Mateo Crime Lab in California. They soon discovered that the DNA profile was already on their system and belonged to a man already doing serious time in prison, Herman Lee Hobbs. 76-year-old Herman Lee Hobbs was already serving time at the Valley State Prison in Chowchilla. Hobbs had lived in Sacramento and worked as a mechanic. Reports suggest that he was married to a woman named Louise Hobbs and had children with her. 
Hobbs was alleged to have been a drug user and also involved in manufacturing methamphetamine for his own use. There is not much information regarding his personal life, but Hobbs's criminal history is extensive and disturbing. In 1969, at age 22, Hobbs was apprehended after leading police on a wild car chase following a spate of robberies in Sacramento. He admitted to being responsible for more than a dozen robberies and agreed to plead guilty to being the serial burglar. However, during his sentencing, he attempted to escape from the courtroom and had to be tackled and subdued by courthouse officers. He was released in 1975 after serving just five years, but the worst was still to come. In the year 2000, Hobbs's criminal career came to a crashing end. He was convicted of assaulting a female from Yuba County, California. Following his conviction, his own daughter and niece came forward with a tip that Hobbs may be responsible for numerous fatal attacks between 1975 and 2000. Investigators looked back at several cold cases and were able to identify Hobbs's movement since his release. In January 1975, 13-year-old Terry Pata had left school early after complaining of feeling sick with a headache. She never made it home. Her body was found nine days later, stuffed in a drain pipe along the route she normally took home. She had been fatally wounded with a knife. Investigators discovered that Hobbs had moved to Rio Linda in 1975 and lived only a block away from Terry's home. With Hobbs's DNA already on file, they tested it against the evidence from Terry's murder and found a positive match. Hobbs was already serving a lengthy sentence for the Yuba County case from 2000. He pleaded no contest to Terry's murder and was given another sentence of 25 years to life. Another cold case resurfaced following Hobbs' arrest. In the year 2000, loggers working near the Yuba County foothills discovered the skull of a woman. The remains were sent off to an anthropology lab in California for DNA testing. The results proved that the skull belonged to 29-year-old Brenda Ann Tucker, who was reported missing in May 1994. Her clothes were found neatly folded by a creek in the Rackerby area, and her car was discovered in a parking lot of a Brownsville market. Brenda was classified as missing until December 2000. After the results from the autopsy, it was proved that it was a gunshot to the back of her head that killed her. Furthermore, witnesses came forward after the discovery claiming that Brenda was murdered. The case went to trial while Hobbs was serving his sentence for Terry's murder. Yuba County Detective Sergeant Phil Spadini testified at the trial. In court, he said that witnesses claimed to have seen Brenda leave Hobbs's residence shortly before he too was seen leaving. He also said the clothing belonging to Brenda was found about a half a mile from the home he shared with his wife Louise in 1994 and included a towel from Hobbs's own home. He further added that Brenda's remains were found a short distance from where Hobbs lived in 1984. Spadini also brought forth two calls received from women in Yuba County that alleged Hobbs assaulted them one of which said her assault occurred near the woods where Brenda's remains were found. Brenda's family said that Hobbs knew them well and was often a house guest during the 1990s. DNA found on the black pants that Brenda was last seen wearing proved to be a match to Hobbs. But on September 17, 2002, during his arraignment, a judge dismissed the case, stating that there was insufficient evidence to link Hobbs to Brenda's murder. Investigators were also looking into a possible link between Herman Lee Hobbs and the disappearance of 35-year-old Jennifer Lynn Wallace from Dobbins in Yuba County. Jennifer was reported missing by her estranged husband in November 1997 after failing to meet him as scheduled. In 2023, Hobbs's name resurfaced after DNA found at the Holly Ann Campilia crime scene matched his own during the reinvestigation of the case. A warrant was issued to obtain Hobbs's DNA in order to confirm a direct match. It proved to be a positive match to the male DNA profile found on the evidence. Hobbs was charged and arrested on February 24, 2023 for the murder of Holly Ann Campilia. He was transferred from the state prison to Solano County Jail. He is being held without bail and on a state prisoner hold.
Hobbs is set to be arraigned on March 13, 2023 in the Solano County Superior Court in Fairfield. Investigators are currently working on investigating five other cases that may be linked to Herman Lee Hobbs. Following the confirmation of Hobbs' involvement in the death of Holly Ann Campilia, the Sheriff's Department released a statement thanking the Campilia family and the investigators working the case. We are grateful to the Campilia family for their patience and assistance, to the labs whose new technology allowed additional testing of older evidence, and to the staff who worked tirelessly to help bring closure to a lifetime of waiting, they said in a statement. Sadly, Holly Ann's sister Karen died aged 47 on June 11, 2009 from natural causes. On July 3, 2016, her mother Sally Campilia also died at age 83 without knowing who was responsible for her daughter's murder. The Solano County Sheriff's Office said that detectives are still working with other agencies in Northern California to identify and possibly link Hobbs to other cold cases and possible victims. For investigators who take on the challenge of cold cases, it becomes a job motivated by determination, dedication, and a responsibility to the families of the victims to see a case through to the end, no matter how many years it takes to find answers. In the case of Holly Ann Campilia, her family's need for answers may be able to bring closure to many other families who may have lost loved ones to the evil motives of Herman Lee Hobbs. What are your thoughts on today's case? Do you think Herman Lee Hobbs could be responsible for more cold cases in the Yuba County area? Please share your thoughts with us in the comments section below, and remember to stay safe always. A 28-year mystery is solved. Investigators have identified the remains known as Windy Point Jane Doe. Hikers found the remains in the area of Windy Point on Divide Road in 1994. There are a lot of Jane Doe cases that haven't been solved in decades. As new DNA testing methods are developed, not only are these sorts of cases, but many unsolved crimes are being solved consistently. On July 7, 1994, Blake Patton, the Forest Service's security supervisor, was informed that a woman hiking with her family had discovered a human skull close to the smokehouse campground off Forest Service Road 402 Divide Road, Colorado. The campers discovered the head and jaw at Windy Point. The information was given to then-investigator Mike Wiggins and a necro team searching for bodies. The investigating team was made up of people from different areas. As officers looked around, they found more bones that belonged to a woman who stood about five feet, six inches tall. The woman's skull had clues to her identity, like gold crowns and signs of temporal mandibular syndrome. There were signs of scoliosis in some parts of the spine. They also found the sacrum, the tailbone, parts of the arm and shoulder bones, and most of the right hip. Most of the bones that were found showed signs of being chewed on by carnivores. Various things were found near the body such as a piece of a belt and a lock of hair that suggested she was either a brunette or a redhead. Investigators thought that some of the remains might have been concealed. What was left showed no signs of injury before death. The report from the autopsy said that a lot of the bones were still missing. Before that, a small update. Allow us to thank Athena Interior for sponsoring this video. They are proficient interior designers that provide high-quality products straight to our homes. It ranges from bathware, kitchenware, homeware with lights, rugs, and artworks. To visit their pool of collections, type AthenaInterior.com and boom, you will land into traditional and elegant decors. In addition to the vast collection, they also have professional customer service for listening to our concerns. Now, coming back to conclude the case. Robert Pickering, a forensic anthropologist, agreed in September 1994 that the woman was at least 35 and possibly over 40, based on how her bones and teeth looked. Her face looked like it belonged to a Caucasian woman. Pickering even found grooves that pointed to a receding gum line, which could have been caused by using a toothpick at the time. He also found damage from carnivores in the form of pieces being broken off, cracks, and chewing. 
Pickering said that the person died within a year of when they were found. He told them, From what I understand, these bones were found on the ground, so it would have started to break down and be eaten by carnivores almost right away. The ID was the most important thing he couldn't figure out. William Rodriguez, who worked as a forensic anthropologist for the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in 1995, couldn't figure it out either. At the time, Canfield was the forensic pathologist at Montrose Memorial Hospital. He asked for a reconstruction of the face. William Rodriguez did the reconstruction and sent it back to Montrose with the bones and what little information he could get from them. He said that they didn't find any clues that would help with the investigation. They hoped facial reconstruction would help find the person who did this. But in reality, it did not do much. The investigators did their best, but they didn't find anything in the end. The detectives didn't give up hope as they kept working on the case and looking for new clues. But over time, no one could do anything about the case, and it became known as the Windy Point Jane Doe case. Investigators were still doing their best, but just like in the beginning, when they added the victim's DNA to the combined DNA index system, they found nothing. Over the years, DNA science and technology kept getting better and better. Canfield sent bone, dry tissue, and hair fragments to the CBI to see if they could be used to make a DNA profile. However, he said in 2008 that he had nothing that could be used to compare the samples to identify the dead person. As the years went by, Canfield and the police asked the public repeatedly for any clue, no matter how small, that could lead to the Windy Point Jane being identified. Even though there was a lot of publicity and a second facial reconstruction done in 2012, no new information solved the case. But DNA technology kept improving, and it was used in more places than just law enforcement and medicine. Canfield said that they would keep the proof until science had caught up with it. Before that, people who wanted to discover their possible ancestry could send a DNA sample to a business that did genealogy research. This became increasingly popular because it helped people find relatives and find out their family trees. It was also sometimes used by the police. Even though the investigators had her DNA, they were not able to run it through the genealogy website because it would have cost about $5,000 for this jurisdiction. In 2020, MCSO investigators Dustin Harlow and Brittany Martinez asked Lt. Ted Valerio for permission to send a DNA sample to the CBI for a family tree test. Valerio permitted them, and Lillard was happy to pay the $5,000 cost. In 2021, Lillard said that the CBI had chosen Windy Point as one of about 100 cold cases where forensic genetic genealogy would be used. They thought it might be a good idea. Then, on April 19th, the CBI called them. Lillard said that they asked me if I was sitting down because they had some excellent news. After working hard and waiting, they finally found a match. He said that submissions to one of the commercial databases for which the CBI made the sample came from the sister and brother of the Hops family. With the DNA and dental records, forensic scientist Denise Venzel from the CBI confirmed that the remains were those of Susan Hops. The Windy Point Jane Doe was finally identified as Susan Hops. When the investigators met Susan's family, they learned who Susan Hops was. Susan was a licensed practical nurse and had lived in California since she was 11 years old. In the summer of 1991, when she was 41, she moved to Lakewood, Washington with a woman who was said to be a possible roommate. In 1992, when she was 44, she was happy to buy a trailer. It was the first time she had lived on her own. At some point, they would be joined by a male friend. Even though she was far away from where she came from, she stayed in touch with her family. Because Susan's trailer was so important to her, it was strange that she would just abandon it. When the mobile home park owner came to her trailer to collect the rent, the door was wide open, 
and trash was all over the place. The drawers were opened. Susan and her two roommates seemed to have left the trailer. Susan's family was from California, but she had an aunt and uncle in Washington who were worried about her. They always talked to Susan and said she lived a pretty calm life. They said she wasn't at high risk for something like this. They were confused about what actually happened to her. They said they started knocking on doors and asking people if they'd seen her. It was said that whatever they found out was strange, including details which had been kept from the public. Susan's family also put an ad in a newspaper saying that her father was very sick and that Susan should call them wherever she was. Sadly, no call ever came. Susan was 44 years old when she was last seen in Lakewood, Washington on August 9, 1993. It said that she and two other people left quickly for some reason. There was a chance that the identity of those two individuals was known, but it wasn't released. It looked like Susan had vanished into thin air. In 2003, her family hired a private investigator, but she could not be found. Amy Johnson was the private investigator who had been looking for her, and when Susan's brother or sister's DNA was finally found, she was notified. Amy was the one who put the information on GED Match, which was a good idea. Amy Johnson thought at first that the call from the Colorado number was spam, but when she heard the message, it was precisely what she had been looking for. After waiting for Susan for over 20 years, the message told her that the Windy Point's Jane Doe in Montrose County was really Susan. Susan had always been important to her. Amy never got paid for working on this case. Amy told the press that her goal had always been to help Susan get what was right. The best thing that could have happened was for her to be found. She said, I've never forgotten about her, even 20 years later. Her picture hangs in a place where I see her. I've always wondered, where are you? Since 2003, she had been looking into possible leads. Amy said that all of it was for Susan. She was a really wonderful person. She fell in with the wrong crowd. No one wanted a member of their family to be found on a hillside. This woman was kind and didn't deserve what happened to her. After years of hard work and dedication, Susan was found after 28 years, but the main point remains that her case is still being looked into, as the cause of death is believed to be murder, and the killer is yet to be found. One of New York's most notorious cold cases has come to a close. A Crime Stoppers tip led investigators to do new information to find the killer of Baby Hope. On an early summer day on July 23, 1991, a horrific discovery was made by construction workers off an embankment of a southbound lane of the Henry Hudson Parkway in Manhattan, New York. The disturbing discovery was of a naked and battered body of a female child inside a dirty picnic cooler. Was she a victim of a pre-planned murder? Or had someone gotten rid of a dead child in a hurry using that place? Welcome to Mysterious Hook, where we shed light on mysterious cases across the country. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel by now, please consider hitting the subscribe and like buttons. Let's dive deep into the mystery without further ado. Manhattan, New York. With the densest population, Manhattan is geographically the smallest of the five boroughs of New York City. Situated on one of the world's largest natural harbors, it is mostly made up of Manhattan Island. Other than its cultural offerings and iconic scenic beauty, the city is known for its towering skyscrapers, including the Empire State Building, neon-lit Times Square, and the theaters of Broadway. Even with such a reputation, the Inwood area of Manhattan became a subject of grim headlines after the discovery of human remains in the summer of 1991. On the early summer morning of July 23, 1991, the New York City Police Department of Washington Heights, 34th Precinct, received a chilling call regarding a gruesome discovery. Two construction workers were repairing a southbound lane along the Henry Hudson Parkway, about 40 miles off of Dykeman Street in Manhattan, New York, when they noticed a foul odor from the wooded embankment area off the road. 
The smell only grew stronger and eventually led the construction workers to a blue and white igloo cooler. After finding the source of the overpowering smell, the workers began to open the lid of the cooler. When they discovered a few cans of Coke, underneath those cans, there was a black plastic bag that contained what seemed like human remains. When the NYPD detectives approached the scene, at first glance, they were not sure if the remains really belonged to a human. This was assumed given the fact that the place was used as an illegal dump site where people often dumped their waste along with deceased animals. However, an inspection of the garbage proved otherwise as the skeletal remains were quickly determined to be human. Inside the garbage bag, the young female child was lying in a fetal position with her hands clasped together, bound with rope and a cord from Venetian blinds. The decomposing body was completely naked and bloated. In addition to the Coke cans, the garbage bag was also surrounded by water, which the investigators suspected to originally be ice. They estimated she had been dead six to eight days before the cooler was found. They believed she was dead for a week, and the hot sunlight not only melted the ice, but pop several of the cans, causing soda to leak out and destroy forensic evidence, such as fingerprints and DNA. The body was then taken to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. Although identifying the body was impossible due to the level of decomposition, the autopsy result brought out several significant details regarding the cause of death and the physical characteristics of the victim. The coroner determined that the child was either white or Hispanic and aged between three to five years. She had long, wavy, dark hair, which was pulled back in a ponytail. The child was also believed to be extremely malnourished, weighing only 28 pounds, which was quite low compared to children of her age. The report also indicated that the young girl had been sexually abused and died on or about July 18, 1991, as a result of asphyxiation. Without a doubt, the findings suggested that the little girl was regularly tortured before her short life came to an abrupt end. Unfortunately, no other clue was found that could lead to the identification of the poor child. Clearly, the NYPD detectives were landed with the daunting task of not only identifying the victim, but also tracking down her killer. In the neighborhood of Inwood, Manhattan, which was considered to be a place of rampant crimes, this crime stood out as a symbol of sheer brutality. In an attempt to crack this case, the NYPD detectives tried out every tactic they could possibly think of, from distributing flyers to urging the people to come forward if they had any knowledge about this Jane Doe. Police tried everything, but came up empty-handed. The murder received plenty of attention from both the police department and the media back then, and investigators had every reason to believe that someone would soon come forward with information. And people did come forward. In the initial phase of the investigation, countless tips came in. One of the tips included a call from a woman that came in just six days after the remains were discovered. The caller, who did not identify herself, said on a Sunday in July 1991, she was going to a wedding, and from the toll booth of the Hudson, they saw a Hispanic man in fleece and a Hispanic woman in heels walking north on the parkway with a picnic cooler in their hand. The lead seemed legit, but did not go anywhere, and in the end, the woman denied cooperating with the police by helping them create a sketch. There were other tips, including a young female drug addict who claimed the girl was her niece and a grieving grandmother who insisted the child was her granddaughter, both of which yielded no results. Sadly, every other lead NYPD detectives followed hit a dead end eventually. Detectives scanned through the National Missing Children databases, but nothing panned out, leaving the deceased child without a name. As the mystery deepened in the case, so did the affection of the detectives for the little Jane Doe. Since no one knew the girl's name and the cops had no way of identifying her, she was given the name Baby Hope because by then, Hope was all they had left in their attempts to solve the Jane Doe case, and they truly hoped that it wouldn't take long for justice to prevail. After a few days of investigation, an anthropologist developed an enhanced sketch based on the bone structure of Baby Hope and distributed it to the media. This was the first sketch that showed what she might have looked like, but even this effort remained fruitless. 
For nearly two years, Jane Doe's corpse remained in the NYPD morgue when detectives decided it was finally time to let her go. In those two years, no family members came forward to claim her, and the NYPD took the responsibility upon themselves to provide her with a proper burial with their own money. On July 23, 1993, on the second anniversary of Baby Hope's remains being found, uniformed cops from NYPD carried the tiny coffin of Jane Doe, which was led by eight children to the Campbell Funeral Home on Wadsworth Avenue, Manhattan. The lead detective, Jerry Giorgio, actively participated in the funeral, while his wife bought a white dress for Baby Hope to offer their affection for a stranger they only knew by death. Not only the detectives, but the community also played their part. More than 500 people from the neighborhood attended the funeral while praying for justice for the little girl. She was buried at St. Raymond Cemetery in the Bronx with the name of Baby Hope etched on her black headstone. Over the years, both the detectives from the NYPD and the people from the community periodically visited her grave and left her things in her honor. Without any solid leads to go on, the investigation into Baby Hope's case went nowhere. Although the NYPD never gave up on this case, the urgency of the case faded away underneath all the new crimes. Throughout the years, there were minor developments in the case, but it mostly remained cold. With every anniversary of Baby Hope's murder, local media in New York ran the story in hopes of refreshing the memories of a potential witness or spreading awareness of this horrific crime. The efforts always fell short, and the case remained cold. By 2000, there were many new technologies and forensic profile developments that were introduced into the criminal system which were not available back in the 90s. Seeing that the technologies were proving to be helpful in other cold cases, the NYPD attempted to utilize these techniques in an attempt to build a forensic DNA profile on Baby Hope and run it through all missing children's databases. But that effort remained unsuccessful. As technology continued to progress, Baby Hope's body was exhumed for DNA tests two times in the span of four years, the first one in 2006 and the second one in 2011. None of them proved to be significant, as detectives were still not able to unveil the mystery of Baby Hope's identity. With encouragement from the public, the NYPD reopened the case in 2013, in July of the same year, on the occasion of the 22nd anniversary of the discovery of Baby Hope, the NYPD tried another round of publicity on the case. Detectives canvassed the neighborhood where her body was found, hung flyers, and distributed the sketches of the girl and a photograph of the cooler. They even announced a $12,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Their efforts finally got a breakthrough in the case for the first time in two decades. After seeing the flyers, a woman called the New York City Crime Stoppers, the tip line for New York City, to share some valuable information. She shared with police a conversation she had overheard in a laundromat two years ago in which a woman claimed that Baby Hope might have been her sister. The tipster also provided several pieces of information to the police regarding the woman's family. This tip led the investigators to a 27-year married Brooklyn mother of three, Laurencita Lorena Ramirez. As investigators knocked on Lorena's door and she opened it, they were met with a shocking mirror image of Baby Hope, if she were alive then. Lorena had a striking resemblance to the police sketch of Baby Hope, almost providing reassurance to the detectives that they might have come to the right place. So, without wasting any time, detectives began questioning Lorena about her missing sister. Lorena said that she had not remembered anything about one of her sisters being missing, even her name. That was until Lorena was 11, and her younger sister, Maribel, rejoined her family after staying with her father's family for years. It was Maribel who told Lorena that she remembered being suddenly awoken by something one night. She then went on to witness her sister's body being stuffed into a refrigerator and placed into a cooler later on. She also remembered looking to the other room and seeing plastic bags placed on the ground along with the conversation between two adults, which included the sentence, she doesn't fit. However, neither Maribel nor Lorena ever came out with this information. 
Lorena did not even link Baby Hope's case to these memories until a few months after the anniversary of the discovery of remains, when she was watching it on a TV channel. The story was eerily convenient as far as Baby Hope's murder was concerned. However, investigators needed a parent for a DNA match, which led them to Lorena's mother. With assistance from Lorena, detectives did not waste much time tracking down her mother, Margarita Castillo, not far from her daughter Lorena. Margarita, at the time, resided in Washington Heights in Queens, New York. However, as eager as investigators were to talk to her, Margarita did not reciprocate the same feelings. She was not interested to talk to the investigators and turned them down before the investigators legally obtained an envelope that had Margarita's DNA on it. The test results of this DNA came back with the answer detectives had been searching for for over two decades. Margarita Castillo was the biological mother of baby Hope. With tears in her eyes, Margarita agreed to talk only when she saw the DNA result and the composite sketch of baby Hope. Margarita let the investigators know that baby Hope was indeed her long-lost daughter, Angelica Castillo. After decades of lying nameless in a Manhattan cemetery, Baby Hope finally got her name back. However, this revelation created more questions than answers. One of the most significant of them was why Margarita would never report her daughter missing in the first place, claiming that she only acted that way because she had no knowledge of Angelica being missing. Margarita began to tell the investigators the story of how she became estranged from her own daughter. Angelica was born on April 24, 1987, to her mother, Margarita Castillo, and her father, Gennaro Ramirez. Despite having several children, the couple's marital life was rocky as Margarita was scared of Gennaro, who had a reputation for being abusive. Just after a few years of Angelica's birth, Margarita and Gennaro separated as a result of their regular fights. According to Margarita, it was after one of those fights in 1991 that she took her three daughters with her and left the home. The next day, Gennaro called her saying that he wanted to meet his daughters. Though still angry due to his behavior, Margarita accepted, considering Gennaro was still the father of the girls. As per Gennaro's instructions, Margarita brought the girls to the house of his adult niece, where he was already present. After spending the night there, Margarita decided to leave the next day, when Gennaro had a strange request for her. He wanted her to leave their two younger daughters, Angelica and Maribel, with him, and take the older Lorena with her. Margarita, who was well aware of his violent nature, knew that it was not just a request, but a threat. Despite not agreeing to the arrangement, Margarita left her younger daughters with him. Margarita also said that she often visited the girls after being forced to leave them with their father and brought them little gifts. During one visit, when she saw that her estranged husband wasn't around, she asked the niece, Belvina Juarez Ramirez, if she could take her kids back, which Belvina rejected, saying that her uncle would be upset if she let the kids go. Margarita claimed that she kept visiting the place until one day the family moved without informing her or leaving any address. Margarita had no idea where her estranged husband or daughters were. In 1995, four years after Baby Hope's remains were found, Margarita got a call from a woman saying that Belvina had passed away. Margarita headed to the location and inquired about her daughters after giving her condolences to the deceased. Unfortunately, nobody in the family told her about the whereabouts of her two daughters, and she came home empty-handed. It was only later that another call from the same woman requesting her to pick up her daughter, referring only to Maribel, that she realized that there was something terribly wrong. She was then informed that Maribel was the only daughter who had been there all along, while well, nobody had any clue where Angelica was. Although Margarita suspected Gennaro of being responsible for Angelica's disappearance, she never went to the police to report her daughter missing. Asserting an explanation for her actions, Margarita said that since her family had illegally immigrated from Mexico and she did not speak English and only spoke Spanish, she was scared to go to the police. Though Margarita accepted her fate, never taking a stand for her own daughter, detectives were dedicated to providing their precious baby Hope with justice. 
they now consider Gennaro Ramirez as the prime suspect in his daughter's disappearance and murder, and a massive search began for him. Unfortunately, to this day, no information about his whereabouts have come to light as he continues to be a missing person. Yet, some people, including Margarita, believe he fled the U.S. and returned to his home country, Mexico. When tracking down Angelica's father failed, everyone thought the mystery of Baby Hope's brutal murder would never be solved until police pointed their fingers at another man. The man was none other than Angelica's own cousin on her father's side and Velvina's brother, then 30-year-old Conrado Juarez Ramirez. Juarez was a regular visitor of the home where Angelica and Maribel were living under the care of Belvina and five other relatives in an apartment in Astoria, Queens. Juarez had a long criminal history comprising different kinds of crime, including sexual assault. Surprisingly, his family still let him hang around the children. Based on past records, NYPD detectives wanted to zero in on this guy and went looking for him. They waited in front of the Manhattan restaurant where he worked as a dishwasher and later brought him in for questioning. Although he was asked questions regarding Angelica's disappearance, detectives still suspected Angelica's father to be the one responsible, until Juarez dropped a bombshell. After initially denying it, a few hours into the questioning, 52-year-old Juarez began confessing to the murder. He revealed that in July 1991, he was visiting his sister Belvina in her queen's apartment when one night he came back to find four-year-old Angelica in the hallway in the middle of the night. Angelica was seemingly looking to go to the bathroom when Juarez took her by the hand into his room and she went with him. At some point, Juarez claimed that alcohol made him lose control and he tried to sexually molest her and she started screaming. To keep her quiet, Juarez bound the little girl to the table, which was often done to her to stop her from getting food or water. He claimed that he did not intend to harm her and only suffocated her to stop her from crying. He then took a pillow and suffocated her until she went motionless. After he was done, he summoned his sister Belvina, who was in another room. Shocked by the incident, she began yelling at him, before quickly deciding they had to get rid of the body instead of notifying the police. Juarez claimed that it was Belvina who gave him a cooler that was in the garage and had a conversation about how they would fit the girl inside it. The very conversation Maribel had heard that night and later revealed to her sister. After binding Angelica's hands and feet, Juarez stuffed the lifeless body inside the cooler, almost in half, and placed Coke cans over it so that it wouldn't look suspicious. The pair then hailed a cab from Astoria to Washington Heights and disposed of the cooler in the wooded area where it was later discovered. Eerily, Juarez's confession perfectly aligned with the tip where a woman saw a Hispanic man and a Hispanic woman carrying a cooler a few days before the discovery, suggesting it was legit all along. Hoping that the remains would never be discovered, the pair parted their separate ways, never to talk about this again. In 1995, Belvina died, taking the disturbing secret to her grave, while Juarez went on with his life as if nothing happened. In this interview with police, Juarez also revealed that Angelica was mistreated and tortured at the hands of Belvina and her family on a regular basis for the last two years of her life. From starving to being harshly punished, the little girl went through an unspeakable amount of suffering in her already short life. It was finally time for her to get justice, as investigators took Juarez into their custody and charged him with first-degree murder. Police would later learn that at one time when Margarita demanded that Juarez let her see her girls, Juarez responded by saying that when he returned from Mexico, there was only one girl and that the other girl was dead. Detectives, who had held Baby Hope close to their hearts all those years, were disgusted by the fact that even after that, Margarita never went to the police or looked for her daughter. When the mother was asked in an interview what she would say to her dead daughter, she replied, I would ask her to forgive me, that I wish I could have stopped him before he could hurt her. Unfortunately, after initially confessing to Angelica's murder, Conrado Juarez Ramirez recanted his words. This time, he claimed that his sister Belvina called him on his cell phone one night in July 1991, describing that Angelica had fallen down the stairs and she needed his help to dispose of her body. 
He then admitted that he helped her bind the child's body. Then he and Belvina drove to the Henry Hudson Parkway, where they dumped her body. After the recantation, prosecutors were having a hard time building a case against him. They were worried due to no forensic evidence linking Juarez to the murder. After Belvina's death, there was no potential witness either. While the investigators persisted that he described many things that only a killer would know, the defense focused more on the forensic evidence. Eventually, the case would come to conclusion after 22 years of a long battle, but not in a way anybody would have wanted. While in jail in 2018, 52-year-old Conrado Juarez Ramirez passed away after falling ill, pending his trial in Manhattan Supreme Court the following year. The case was officially closed after the only suspect was killed. As for Angelica's father, Gennaro Ramirez, investigators concluded that although he might have other potential victims of his own, he was most likely unaware of his daughter's fate once he left home and never came back. There is no doubt that this poor four-year-old girl had been through a lot before tragically being murdered and left to rot. Yet, it's amazing to see strangers pouring out their love for her while her own family failed and betrayed her. We can only hope that the little one could rest in peace with her name on her gravestone after two decades. Do you think that her death could have been prevented if her mother intervened? As always, let us know your thoughts on this tragic story in the comment section. 42-year-old cold case with a long-awaited identification of a body found in the Stilaguamish River. For decades, that person was known only as Stilly Doe. We didn't know about this, finding this body. The person that found it, I know very well after we moved back to Savannah. On July 23, 1980, a young farmer from a small peaceful town in Washington came across the remains of what looked to be a man. The autopsy later revealed it to be a man in his late 50s. The remains had been there for about a month. The forensic investigation, which was still in its infancy, revealed very little about the man. He was later given the moniker John Doe. Our story today takes us to the city of Arlington. It is one of the most beautiful river valleys in western Washington. Snohomish County has a rich and vibrant history of logging and agriculture. After World War I, agriculture, dairy farming, and shingle mills were some of the main sources of income for the residents. After the Second World War, Arlington remained a typical small American town with logging and agriculture as the main source of livelihood for many. Life was normal by those standards, but it wasn't until the 1960s that the population grew by more than 400%. Our case today takes us to this place at a time 40 years ago. When a teenage boy discovers unidentified remains of a man in the most famous river in all of western Washington, the Stillaguamish River. It was July 23, 1980. Spencer Fuentes was a young farmer and a devoted Protestant who went to the Lutheran Church in Silvana. Spencer had his trousers carelessly rolled up above his knees with his ankles submerged in water as he threw streamers and dry flies to bait a fish. In Arlington, fly fishing was quite the trend in those days. Spencer was at the Stillaguamish River on his blueberry and hazelnut farm working on his skill as an angler. He was alone at the time when he caught a whiff of a stench. It was invasive but tolerable, and so he began looking around for the source. It must have been a dead animal, was what he thought to himself as he looked around the premises. And that is when he found something he would have never expected. He saw something floating between the logs at the riverbank, and when he walked closer to look, he saw a man's arm with his fingers dangling on the log, with the rest of his body submerged under the river. He didn't dare go any closer and hurried back to the nearest police station. The sheriff's deputy responded with skepticism as no one had reported someone missing, but he went with Spencer to speculate anyway. The deputy later confirmed it to be a body. Soon the backup arrived and they took the remains into custody. An investigation ensued and they began checking the perimeter. 
The deputies could only concur that it could have been anything. It could have been a suicide or maybe another fly fisherman enthusiast who met with an accident while swinging his fishing line. He was wearing a dark suit jacket and cotton pants, and all they had was three letters on the belt, G, R, and N to work with. These could be the initials of his name, but could just as well be anything else. They determined the age of the deceased to be anywhere between 37 to 70, but that was too wide a range to work with. The river wasn't deep, and it certainly wasn't deep enough to drown, but it could still be a possibility, and the condition that the body was in made it certain that the person must have been dead for months. When a body is submerged in water for long periods of time, anything can happen. There could be predatory animals looking for food, and there could be bloating in the remains from the bacterial activities, putrefaction, and soft tissue discoloration. All of these factors make it hard for the investigators to identify the deceased and proceed further with the investigation. July is the warmest and driest month in Washington, and the temperature of the water could turn the skin into soapy fatty acids called grave wax. The only probable explanation they could infer was drowning, but it was later ruled out when the autopsy reports came in. Dr. Clayton Haberman, who performed the autopsy, cited the cause to be apparently natural. The autopsy reports determined that the decedent had no signs of trauma or any signs of drowning. While they did find water in the lungs of the deceased, that was just because the person was in the water for a long time. But the reports had a section that could easily solve the mystery. The person had severe coronary artery disease, and that was much more likely the cause of his death. It is a fairly common disease among the elderly and those with diabetes, high blood pressure, and alcohol issues. A condition when the arteries that carry blood to the heart get hard and narrow. The case was solved and it was not a murder. But who was this man? According to Dr. Heberman's report, the deceased was a male who stood 5 foot 7 inches tall and weighed about 150 pounds. They were not able to pinpoint an age, but he had gray hair, indicating he was on the older side. The deputies could not just take a picture and put it in the newspapers, as the face was barely recognizable. With very little to work with, they sought help from a dentist. Dr. Keith Leonard sifted through his dental records, comparing the deceased's teeth with the files of known missing persons. As expected, all efforts went in vain. With no hope, the Snohomish County Coroner's Office tagged the decedent as John Doe No. 2 and put the name in a file with a case number 80-7-526. About three weeks after the discovery of the decedent, on the 15th of August, 1980, John Doe No. 2 was buried at the Arlington Cemetery by the Weller Funeral Home, but the deputies never stopped looking. It was a common practice to bury John Doe's or unidentified remains back then, but these days the unidentified skeletal remains which are discovered are kept at the Snohomish County Medical Examiner's Office until they find the family. The skeletal remains were buried under a plot. The grave was marked John Doe, 1980 which just seemed like a dignified, unmarked grave. The deputies were tirelessly working on the missing cases, comparing these John Doe's to many records of people who had vanished without a trace. It was 2008 when a cold case detective, Jim Scharf, from the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office, teamed up with a retired Superior Court judge of Snohomish County, Ken Cowsert. When they finally had hope, they began reopening unsolved homicide cases and comparing them with all the John and Jane Doe's in Snohomish County. By then, DNA technology had evolved enough for them to be able to solve these cases, or at least partially identify them. But these unidentified people were already resting in their graves, and during the initial investigations, no DNA samples were taken. They wrote a permission letter to exhume the remains from the Arlington Municipal Cemetery but the entire process of obtaining the exhumation permits and conducting the DNA testing could take years. In late 2017, while the world prepared for Christmas, 
the deputies and the representatives from the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office and the Medical Examiner's Office were at the Arlington Municipal Cemetery, exhuming the remains from the grave. Some parts of the remains were taken to the Medical Examiner's Office for DNA extraction. They gathered these DNA from many. They had a lot of John Doe genome to work with, and so the Medical Examiner's Office further nicknamed it I-5 Stilly Doe. The process took time, and about six months later, in May 2018, this newfound DNA information was uploaded to National Missing and Unidentified Person Systems, or NamUs, a federal database that is funded by the National Institute of Justice. The database keeps a track of all the information of anyone missing, unidentified, and unclaimed from all around the nation. The database has dental records, fingerprints, and basically anything that can help them identify individuals. The database was still growing, and so after they had uploaded the details, all they could do was wait. NCIC, or National Crime Information Center Database, is the FBI's database, which is a computerized index that keeps a track of crimes and incidents, including missing person cases. Forensic odontologist Dr. Gary Bell took a dental radiograph of the decedent, dubbed John Doe No. 2 charted the teeth, and then uploaded them to NCIC, but that was, again, to no avail. But with the new advancements in technology, they had a lot of other ways to make it work. A month later, a forensic artist took all of the existing information on John Doe No. 2 and drew a facial reconstruction entirely based on facial morphology. The forensic artist, Natalie Murray, prepared a drawing that wasn't a photographic image, but an interpretation of the person based on the information provided. These drawings were meant to resemble the missing person and were made in hopes that someone might recognize the man. But that was to no avail. It had been 38 years since the body was discovered, and they must have thought it would take a miracle for someone to remember someone who they knew 38 years ago. Dr. Kathy Taylor stepped up and investigated further. They had almost everything on the man. With a forensic facial reconstruction by Natalie Murray and Dr. Kathy Taylor's estimation of the man based on the remains, this is what they had. The man could be of Native American, Caucasian, or Hispanic origin. A 45 to 60 year old man standing 5 foot 9 with coronary artery disease. Although there was no paramortem trauma, the remains did indicate the man had damaged his ribs at some point of time in his life. There was evidence of well-heeled rib and spinal compression fractures. The investigation had already taken too long. The sheriffs retired, but the search didn't. The researchers took a shot at mailing a section of a thigh bone, the femur, to the University of North Texas Health Sciences Center for DNA Extraction and to be uploaded to CODIS. CODIS or Combined DNA Index System, is where all of the DNA information is stored and compared. CODIS aims to be the biggest DNA database. When the university obtained a full mtDNA and STR profile of the deceased, they uploaded them to CODIS. But that did not help either. It was normal for a DNA profile to not yield any matches, as the database was fairly new. In the following years, Snohomish County tried a number of methods including going back to the files, matching and ruling out these new components like STR testing, dental records, and others. By 2021, genetic genealogy had gathered quite a name for itself. The method had provided positive results over the past two years, and they were able to identify several John Doe's. And this time, a fraction of I-5 Stilly Doe's thigh bone was sent for DNA extraction. They asked Othram Incorporated to prepare DNA profiles suitable for the Forensic Genetic Genealogy Database. The 41-year-old femur was in the Othram labs for about five months until they successfully obtained a sufficient DNA extraction after multiple rounds of extracts and enrichments. Finally, they managed to build a DNA profile that could be uploaded to the genealogical database. The Snohomish County Medical Examiner's Office uploaded the DNA profile received from Othram Incorporated to GEDmatch. It is a global database of DNA data, a free utility DNA site built for genetic genealogy research. Finally, there was a match. 
but it was a distant cousin. In a fifth to seventh range, there was a high chance that they might not even know the person, but this lead was enough to spark a new interest in the case. Building a usable family tree usually requires a second cousin match or something closer to establish a proper connection. A kin forensics investigator, Deb Stone, began working on the case, and in May 2022, the Steely Doe profile was uploaded to a database called FamilyTreeDNA.com. This too yielded very low results, but what mattered was that there were new matches. These matches piled up together in a single family tree could perhaps finally solve the mystery of John Doe number two. Deb Stone began putting two and two together, looking for family members near the areas where the body was first discovered. 42 years is a long time, and it was very unlikely for a distant cousin to remember someone from that many years ago. The woman she was going to meet had descendants in the state of Washington. This was a distant cousin, but a cousin nonetheless. When Deb Stone interviewed her, she recalled a relative who once told her about an uncle who went missing from Arlington back in the 1980s. The investigators finally had a name, Othaniel Philip Ames, but that was a huge if. The Othaniel they described was told to be 82 years old when he went missing, but the DNA profile and other reports estimated that the remains were of a person who must be in his 40s to 60s. For a DNA reference, they took DNA samples from a granddaughter, which ultimately was the nail in the coffin. John Doe number two and I-5 Stilly Doe were indeed Othaniel Philip Ames. Dr. Matt Lacey, the chief medical examiner, officially identified John Doe number two as Othaniel Philip Ames in September. Othaniel told his family that he was going on a trip before he left, a month before his remains were found. He said he was going to take a tour of the country and meet his friends and relatives starting from the West Coast. It was much more likely to be a suicide case where an old man is gradually giving away everything he possesses. Before his disappearance, Othaniel gave a Bible about the size of a passport to his grandniece, Kay Taylor. She says that this was on Thursday, the 8th of January, 1980, as it was written on the dedication page. He gifted his old car, which was only worth a couple of hundred dollars, to Diane Elledge and her husband. Elledge recalls Othaniel whispering to them that he had hidden $20 somewhere in the car as an emergency fund. Othaniel also gave them a vintage shotgun. While she did not know why he gave those things to her, her sister thinks it is because he liked the married couple as they had invited him to their wedding. Elledge said something very sad about Othaniel. She said that he knew the end was near and he was very ill. He just went up into the woods to die there. Othaniel also gave his house away to a nursing student who might have been his neighbor at the time. The irony here is how, in a press conference, Margaret Ames talks about Spencer and how they met. We didn't know about this finding this body. The person that found it, I know very well after we moved back to Sylvana. The young teen who discovered the remains of Nathaniel Philip Ames at the time, Spencer Fuentes, actually met Margaret Ames, the daughter-in-law of Nathaniel Philip Ames, when she moved back to Sylvana with her husband in the early 1990s, 10 years after the incident. She met Spencer Fuentes through the Lutheran Church, but they never talked about rivers or remains. Doug Ames, Nathaniel's grandson, took the day off work to meet Spencer Fuentes and his family. Othaniel Philip Ames was born on the 23rd of August, 1898 in Elwood, Iowa. He saw some of the worst days in his life as he was only 20 years old when World War I broke out. He lived in a small town called Bone Steel in South Dakota, and the entire town only had 600 people at the time. Othaniel had to leave his hometown for better job opportunities and quality of life like many other young people living in Bone Steel. Today, only 249 people are living there. In 1929, he went on to marry Lydia Newth, a 25-year-old woman, in a town with only a couple dozen residents at the time. A place called Cottonwood is located in South Dakota, and even today only 11 people live in the entire town. Life was hard 
and the approaching stock market crash meant it was going to get harder. The shadows of war had engulfed the nation, and it was chaos everywhere. Othaniel was there trying to save his family, trying to survive. About seven years later, the Ames family decided to move. The entire family moved across the country. A man, a pregnant wife, and their kids with a trailer latched onto their car. Othaniel and his sons worked hard and built a farm on 22 acres of land. The family kept seven dairy cows and Othaniel became a milkman. Lydia would cook on a wood stove and Othaniel would milk the cows and farm. Those days, life wasn't as easy as it is now, and the war made it even harder. Apart from farming, Othaniel also had a lathe in his basement where he would carve salt and pepper shakers, among other things which he would just give away. Othaniel also began working at a shingle mill, and when he had time to spare, he'd make dandelion wine. He wasn't the type to sit around. He always kept himself busy. Life taught him the hard way, and he grew up to be a stern man. But life wasn't easy, and it was as though he was always looking for reasons to be happy always looking for a way to distract himself. Tragedy struck when one of their daughters died in a car crash while she was on her way to her 10th high school reunion. Even though they never had an official divorce, the married couple got separated sometime in the 1960s. The family was in fragments as both the sons joined the military when they were teenagers. One of them served in the Air Force and married a young Norwegian woman in Sylvana. After the separation, the Ames family sold their farm but most importantly their home, which they built after facing so much hardship. Lydia moved to Everett, and Othaniel went on to live in a small cabin in the woods, all alone somewhere near Arlington, along the Eby Mountain Road. He had a very minimal lifestyle, and all he had with him was his pet dog, who knew how to close doors by backing into them. I guess it's safe to say he was an avid outdoorsman. There he grew dahlias, and kept to himself. He was a loner and all he wanted was peace. The log cabin was comfortable enough for one person, even though he did not have an indoor bathroom, but he had hollowed out a huge stump to compensate for it. He spent the last of his days at the log cabin alone with his dog. The last time Diane Elledge saw him, he was ill. It was evident during the autopsy that he had severe coronary artery disease. In his last moments, he knew it was the end, and so he chose to leave silently. It is ironic how Margaret Ames is around the same age now as Nathaniel Ames was when they finally found him. This case shows how modern ways of life have created a huge gap between parents and children. Nathaniel chose to stay alone and away from everyone, even during the times when he needed someone to stay beside the most, as he did not want to be a burden. For more than a decade, she's only been known as Jane Doe from Opelika. She has a name and she has a story, a very horrific and sad one. On January 28, 2012, residents of a mobile home in Opelika, Alabama, found the remains of a little child in their backyard. No one knew how it had gotten there, and detectives would be mystified for more than 10 years until advanced DNA technology unraveled a family secret that no one was supposed to find out. So what exactly could have happened to the poor innocent child? And how did her remains get to where they were found? Today's case will take us to Opelika, a city located in the east central part of the state of Alabama. It is the capital city of the county of Lee and boasts a population of more than 30,000 people. Opelika is famous for the Robert Trent Jones Grand National Golf Course which has been the venue for several national and other important golf competitions. Apart from this, the city is also popular for its vibrant art scene, historic downtown area, and other scenic tourist spots. Amore was born in Virginia on the 1st of January, 2006, to parents Sherry Wiggins and Lamar Vickerstaff. At the time of her birth, her mother Sherry was only 20. Lamar, on the other hand, was in his mid-30s, and was a military man serving with the Navy. She was a blessing, she was smart, and she was special, and that's why I named her Amore, which in Spanish means love, Sherry said of her daughter. 
Soon after Amori came into the world, Sherry's and Lamar's relationship took a hit. Something that made matters worse was the fact that Lamar's relatives had frowned on his romance with Sherry from the start. And when their affair eventually produced a child, they had more cause to be displeased. They were simply disappointed that Lamar now had a child out of wedlock. With the growing tension, Sherry had no other choice but to take Amore and move out of the apartment she and Lamar shared. This was in 2006. She began to take care of her daughter on her own and got little to no help from Lamar with maintaining their daughter's well-being. Shortly after this, Lamar got married to another woman and moved on with his life. Sherry was hurt and decided to drag Lamar to court in order to at least get child support from him for Amore. But things didn't go as planned. Sherry had some legal troubles of her own, and this proved to be her undoing. At that time, I was making some bad decisions and some bad choices in my life where I did have some run-ins with the law. Due to this, the court system labeled her as unstable and decided that Amore would be better off in the care of Lamar. In addition to this, the court also directed Sherry to begin paying child support to Lamar, since he was to begin caring for Amore. And so, in 2009, when Amore was about three years old, she permanently went to live with her father and his wife, Ruth. It did make sense for her to be somewhere more stable, Sherry said. Even though Amore had been taken away from her custody, she ensured that she played an active role in the little girl's life and would occasionally visit her at Lamar's residence. However, this soon came to an end. Lamar was transferred to Hawaii by the Navy, and he had to move there with his family. Due to this, Amore was now even farther away from her mother. Sherry was saddened by this unexpected occurrence, and over the years, she went to court to try and regain custody of Amore, but it was all to no avail. At some point, she was told she could no longer appeal the case, and this meant that Amore would continue to remain in the care of her father till she turned 18. I felt like they made me feel so bad about myself. I kept trying and the doors kept being closed. I felt like the best I could do was live out my financial obligation, which I never stopped. I felt like one day I could tell her, I never gave up on you, and all I could do was take care of you financially, and that is what I did. If I couldn't do anything, I could care for my daughter by supporting my child financially, Sherry said. Despite how everything turned out, Sherry kept hoping that one day she would see her child again. But sadly, this would never happen. At around 10.47 a.m. on January 28, 2012, the Opelika Police Department received a call from a resident of a mobile home community located at 1775 Hearst Street in Opelika, Alabama. The call was about a discovery that was strange and disturbing. The skull of a human being had been found outdoors. Police officers quickly jumped into their vehicles and made their way to the scene. When they got there, they were met by the person who had placed the emergency call. The individual was a woman named Yvonne Johnson, and she wasted no time in explaining to the officers that her son had been the one who found the skull in their backyard. According to Yvonne, the skull had not been there a day before and its sudden appearance had been startling. After she told them this, she led officers to the back of the mobile home to see for themselves, and true enough, lying on the ground in plain sight was a skull. It was quite small, and they could tell by just looking at it that it was a child's. In addition to this, officers also noticed that it had a few strands of hair on it. Its presence there was odd, and officers could not help but wonder where the rest of the body was. The area was quickly secured and detectives were notified. When they got to the scene, they immediately did a sweep of the mobile home community. The aim of this was to see if they could find any more skeletal remains, but nothing turned up. With the day getting dark, detectives were forced to give up their search for the day. It wasn't until two days after the shocking discovery that detectives were able to locate some human remains. These were found in the woods, several feet away from where the skull had been found. Detectives also found a pink long sleeve shirt with ruffles and heart-shaped buttons alongside the remains. All of these were collected and then sent to the lab for forensic analysis. Finding out the identity of the child shot to the top of the list of priorities for the detectives. Forensic analysis and autopsies were performed on the remains at an FBI laboratory located in Quantico. 
There, it was discovered that it belonged to a black female, and she was speculated to have died between 2010 and 2011. Her age was estimated to be between 4 and 7 years old, and in addition to this, the medical examination also revealed something chilling. The deceased girl had previously suffered several broken bones that were already healing before she died. Her bones also indicated that she had been malnourished while alive. That was not all. A fracture was also noticed in her left eye socket, and this made detectives believe that she had been blind in the left eye. They speculated that this facial deformity would have been obvious to anyone while she was alive. In the end, her death was ruled a homicide, and detectives immediately began an investigation. They had no idea who she was, but they were determined to uncover her identity. Since they could not tell what name she had been given, they decided to call her Opalika Baby Jane Doe. Since that day, Baby Jane has been part of our OPD family, said Opalika Police Chief Shane Healy. One of the first things detectives tried to do was develop a DNA profile for the deceased girl, but the conditions of the remains made this impossible. When this failed, detectives began to review thousands of school and birth records, but their efforts yielded no result. There was no record of any missing child around the age of the deceased girl, and no one came forward for a long time to provide any useful information about her. Things would remain silent until 2016. That year, a forensic artist from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children was able to come up with sketches of what baby Jane might have looked like before her death. The sketches showed her dressed in a pink shirt with heart-shaped buttons. This was similar to the clothing that was found near her remains. These sketches were then released to the public with the hopes that someone would recognize her. Several weeks went by after this and nothing came up. But when they least expected, they got a very crucial piece of information from someone. This was in September 2016. The individual who came forward to provide the information had been a former Bible school teacher at a church known as the Greater Peace Baptist Church. The church was located in Opelika and was less than a 15-minute drive from where the skeletal remains had been found. According to the former Bible school teacher, she had seen a young girl back in 2011 who looked like baby Jane. The teacher told detectives that the girl had looked slightly unkempt and had been unable to communicate fluently with other children. And because of this, she had mostly kept to herself. When asked if she remembered the girl's name, she told them that she didn't. With this information, detectives went to the church and took a look at the photographs that had been taken back in 2011. After going through several photos, they came upon the picture of the little girl that had been described by the teacher. Detectives could immediately see that her description fitted perfectly with that of baby Jane. She had an obvious deformity in her left eye, just like they had speculated from examining baby Jane's remains. The photos that were obtained from the church were a bit blurry, and so they had to use special software to enhance them. These photos were then released to the public. The following year, detectives employed the help of the University of South Florida to perform a procedure known as isotope testing on baby Jane's remains. This method involves analyzing the number and type of isotopes present in a sample, which can provide information about the age, origin, and composition of materials. After the test was done, it was discovered that the deceased girl had a higher amount of lead in her system, and this indicated that she may have been raised in Alabama or somewhere in the southeast. Everybody has a certain amount of lead, and it depends on where you are raised, what type of drinking water you've had, said Opelika Police Captain Jonathan Clifton. Several months went by after this, and detectives had nothing to go on. However, they never relented and were determined not to leave any stone unturned. To them, the case was like a black cloud that loomed over the community, and solving it was sure to bring a sense of fulfillment. In January 2022, the Opelika Police Department partnered with Othram Laboratories to carry out advanced DNA testing on the remains. They had not been successful in carrying out a DNA test on the bones in the past, but they believed that advances in the world of forensic science would make it possible. They were very difficult skeletal remains to actually create a profile from especially the kind of profile that you need to do genealogy, said Kristen Middleman, Chief Development Officer at Othram Labs. The lab used a unique technique known as forensic-grade genome sequencing and was able to finally extract DNA from the remains. After doing this, the DNA was then used to build a profile for the girl and it was then uploaded to the database. 
With this in place, detectives sought the help of a renowned and experienced genealogist by the name of Dr. Barbara Ray Venter. Over several weeks, Dr. Barbara and her team, Firebird Forensic Group, worked round the clock to try and identify close relatives of the deceased girl using the DNA profile that had been created. Their hard work eventually paid off because in October 2022, they were able to determine who the girl's father was. It was a moment of joy for detectives because they had finally made a discovery that had evaded them for more than 10 years. It was a large piece of the puzzle that had finally been resolved. As for the girl's father, he was none other than Lamar, the naval officer who fathered a child with Sherry back in 2006. Detectives would not know until later that baby Jane was actually Amore, Lamar and Sherry's child. When detectives did a background check on Lamar, they discovered that he was still alive and was in the process of retiring from the Navy. They also found out that he was stationed in Jacksonville, and they decided to visit him there to inform him about the death of his daughter. In December 2022, detectives traveled to Naval Station Mayport in Jacksonville. They hoped that Lamar would provide them with details about his daughter. However, this ended up not being the case. After they met Lamar, he was strangely unwilling to talk about the little girl and avoided every question thrown at him. This immediately raised suspicion in the minds of detectives, but there was nothing they could do at that point. The meeting with Lamar did not go as expected, but this did little to discourage detectives. Instead, they intensified their investigation and also discovered that Lamar had a wife, Ruth. They eventually met with her, but just like her husband, she provided no helpful information. However, she told detectives that she had no idea who Lamar's daughter was or who the mother could have been. Detectives knew from that moment that they had to find out who the little girl's biological mother was. Dr. Barbara and her team got to work once again, and soon they were able to determine that the woman they were looking for was Sherry. It was also discovered that she was living in Maryland. Detectives traveled down there, and during the course of the meeting they had with Sherry, they got to find out a lot. She told them that she gave birth to a girl back in 2006, and she had named her Amore. However, she expressed shock upon hearing that Amore had been dead for more than a decade. She explained to detectives that she had lost custody of the child to the father, Lamar, and when Lamar moved to Hawaii, she no longer had any contact with her daughter. When she had reached out to Lamar, his response had been cold, and he had warned her not to call again. During the course of all this, I would still reach out. I would reach out via email over the years, and they would block my email accounts, Sherry said. I called Lamar's number that I knew to be his, and he told me that if I called again, he would block me from his phone, she added. She continued to call, and Lamar stayed true to his words by blocking her, and at some point, he even threatened her with the police. Despite the fact that she had not laid eyes on her daughter for years, she told detectives that she continued to pay child support and had till the end of 2022. To back up her claim, she showed them documents that contained detailed information about the child support. The shock written on the faces of the detectives was quite visible after Sherry finished telling her side of the story. They could hardly believe their ears. After getting back to their base, they began to reach out to the school boards as well as clinics located in the states Lamar and Ruth had resided in after they gained custody of Amore. By doing this, they were able to discover that Amore was never enrolled in any school. There was also no record to show that the couple reported the little girl missing. This was all the confirmation they needed to know that Lamar and Ruth had something to do with her death. On January 17, 2023, the couple was arrested in Jacksonville and held at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Lamar was charged with felony murder and Ruth with failure to report a missing child. Two days after this, a press conference was organized and Opelika Police Chief Shane provided in-depth details regarding the case. He also expressed his gratitude to all those who had contributed in one way or the other to ensure that the case got solved. The level of dedication to this case I have never seen in my entire career. To see a group of men and women come together searching for a name. Many of us said that we did not want to leave our time at this police department until we had her name. And now we do. Amore Wiggins, Shane had said. Sherry, on the other hand, remains grateful to the detectives for their dedication to the case, and she wants to see justice served. She was just a baby. They deprived her of everything. She was a child, Sherry said. At the moment, 
The case remains open and detectives continue to gather additional information in regards to Amore's relationship with Lamar and Ruth. Lamar's and Ruth's fate also remains to be determined. Amore certainly suffered terrible abuse and neglect before her death, but thankfully the long hand of the law has caught up with those involved in such an evil act. It's still yet unknown how Amore died, but how do you think that happened? And to what extent do you think Lamar and Ruth contributed to her death? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe.